I'm Alex Green, and this is Stereo Embers, the podcast. Check this out. You're hearing Gold by Sister Sparrow, featuring my guest today on the program, Arlie Kinchelo. Now, I should tell you that when Arlie is on stage, she goes by the name Sister Sparrow. The band behind her, well, those are the Dirty Birds. So when I say Sister Sparrow and the Dirty Birds, now you know exactly what I'm talking about. You guys can handle that, right? Of course you can. Let me tell you a little bit about Sister Sparrow and the Dirty Birds. But before I do that, dig, if you will, a picture of you as a kid declaring your career goals to your parents. Now, for most of us, as we got older, that goal shifted and morphed. So a pronouncement of, I'm going to be an astronaut, was replaced by, I'm going to be a fireman. And then later, the president, a doctor, a veterinarian, a lawyer, a baseball player, a bassist for a punk band, a content editor of a well-funded tech startup in San Francisco. Some of us dreamed very specifically. The point is, when we're younger, we don't really know what we want to do. So we keep taking a new dream out for a spin, and then we lose interest, and we shed that skin, and then another, and then another, and then another, until before we know it, We've graduated from college with an English degree, and we're like, how'd that happen, and now what? Okay, so that's a familiar story. In my case, way too familiar. But then there's another story, the story of a kid who knows exactly what they want to do when they grow up, and then they grow up, and they're doing it. Well, that's the story of Arlie Kinchelow, who had a vision of her future at a very young age, and moved unwaveringly towards it. Now, just to give you some background, Kinchelow grew up in the famed Catskill Mountains in southeastern New York. And hearing that, you're probably thinking that the legacy of great musicians, comedians, and writers who passed through the Catskills and made names for themselves there surely must have inspired her to pursue the creative life. Well, you wouldn't be wrong. But also nudging her in that direction was the fact that her parents were musicians and had a big band that Kinchelow and her brother Jackson often played in when they were just kids. Now, when your parents have a band, that could go one of two ways. A, you become a musician because it's in your blood, and you accept that it's part of your legacy and destiny because you've always done it, and it's the most natural thing in the world for you to do. Or B, you become an accountant. Spoiler alert. Kinchelow and her brother are not accountants. Now, fittingly enough, Sister Sparrow is the nickname that Kinchelow's older sister gave her. And Kinchelow decided to perform under that moniker when she and her brother formed the band Sister Sparrow and the Dirty Birds back in 2008. Sister Sparrow and the Dirty Birds did things the old-fashioned way. Kill it at home, then conquer the world. After a year in the trenches playing every club all over New York the band found themselves being known as one of the best live acts around. They ended up securing a weekly residency at the Rockwood Music Hall. That residency ran for five months. Not bad for a band who, at that point, hadn't even put out a record. In 2010, that first record finally arrived. A self-titled affair, it was pretty much recorded live at New York's Avatar Studios over the course of one night. 
Not only was that album jazzy, breezy, and soulful, it captured the urgency of the band in a live setting. That album set the pace. Over the next eight years, Sister Sparrow and the Dirty Birds kept up not only a breakneck touring schedule, they kept turning out great album after great album. Pound of Dirt came out in 2012, The Weather Below hit in 2015, and there's a 2016 live album, which is just a straight-up scorcher. It's called Foul Play, and Foul is spelled with a W. After all, it is Sister Sparrow, and it is the Dirty Birds, so why abandon the avian theme now? And speaking of now, now is where we are, and where we are is gold. Gold is the name of Sister Sparrow's new album, and it's an album that's positively glowing with beauty and truth. A riveting blast of soulful ballads, horny blues, and funky swagger. Listening to Gold is like listening to indie rock gospel. The album is awesome. The title track is an upbeat workout, Ghost is soaked in spectral Motown, and Let's Go is a delicious blend of fuzz and snarl. Putting it as simply as I can, the album is soulfully exquisite and utterly life-affirming. And speaking of life, Kinchlow just brought a new one into the world. She's a mom now. And in this conversation, not only do we talk about motherhood, in the middle of it, she leaves to go change a diaper. I've interviewed thousands of bands, and that's never happened before. And she changes that diaper really fast, like super fast, like, well, in her words gunfighter fast so she's a quick draw mom and she's also really nice and incredibly sweet so here's my conversation with sister sparrow arlie kinchelo enjoy it right here on stereo embers the podcast you good yeah, yeah, I'm a little sick, so I'm sorry if I sound kind of weird. But. No, no, I, I would think that for a singer to get sick is like the worst thing. Yeah, it's pretty rough. <laughs> um, it can really uh, take down a show, you know. Um, luckily, we don't have to play for about a week, so. Well, you have time to get better. I It's funny because I, I teach college and I do this radio show, and if my voice goes, I'm finished. I can't do my jobs. Yeah, it's crazy how, you know, how much we just take it for granted to just be there, even just to speak. But then if you're in trouble, you know, kind of wipes you out for a few days. <laughs> I know, I know. Are you uh, are you germophobic at all? Not at all. <laughs> so that's probably why I got sick. Cause <laughs> <don't>, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I also have a toddler, so, you know, he's, he's running around daycare. I'm sure that's where it came from, but. Well, it's funny because I talk for my jobs, and so I get kind of germophobic because I'm like, if I get sick, then I can't do anything. And then I, at any rate, I would, I would think, I, I always wondered if a, uh, if a singer was very protective of their, of their health because of their job. Yeah, I mean, I, I am protective of my health, but I don't, I wouldn't go so far as to say I think about germs a lot. But I definitely like take a lot of supplements, and and if I start to feel sick, I have like a whole course of action that sometimes I can't catch it in time but um, especially on the road you know I'm like constantly taking echinacea and I take slippery elm for my voice to stay that's actually something you should look into if you don't know about it it's really helpful um, it's like a, a bark root thing that helps it's called slippery elm like you can get like a tincture or lozenges but it saves my saves my voice sometimes for sure okay so we've established that I'm the neurotic one here with the uh <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, I know you're busy today. I appreciate you doing this. Are you one of those people that operates well the busier you are? Um, I don't know if I would say that. I definitely think there's something to be said about um, when we're on the road, there's a certain pace that we keep, and it's nice, but I, I, am, I definitely need my rest. Um, I, I think – especially because of the, you know, close connection that my body has to my work, as you can understand. Um, if I'm a little run down, it just really kind of can derail the whole thing. So I definitely need a certain amount of days off and I need, I can't sing too many days in a row. So I, I'm, I'm not one of these like 
uh, I'll sing, you know, every day for 14 days straight kind of people, which there are people like that. And I, I wish I could be like that, but um, I have a kind of a sensitive uh, vocal cord, I guess, situation. <laughs> um, so it can, it, I've, I've definitely had to cancel shows because uh, I was a little overworked and depending on the climate in which we are traveling, uh, that can be real make or break for me sometimes. Are those things that you consider now that maybe you didn't 10 years ago? Like, when we, let's schedule our tour. Or let's schedule it in a really – in a totally different way than we used to when, when we were younger. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we used to just say yes to every single gig that was offered because when you're first starting out, you have to do that. You know, you can't – you really can't – beggars can't be choosers, as we say. But, um, but then I think a couple of times that I, you know, learned, learned the hard way that – I can't push myself that hard and everybody, anybody else in the band can get really sick and it could be like not great, but it could be okay. But if I, you know, if I can't sing, I can't sing. So I had, I had to kind of put down my foot a little bit and say, here are some guidelines, you know, I can't do this and I need some time off and I can blah, blah, blah. So it always makes, it's always the hardest right around um, a record release because inevitably you, again you really don't want to say no to anything you want to be doing as much as you can to promote your new product and and this and that but uh so i, I find myself getting sick around those times um and like hence right now you know yeah. <laughs> like a week after the album came out so <laughs> yeah i guess we're, we're kind of right in the in the storm of that moment that you're talking about yeah for sure uh, what happens to your voice? Do you feel that you, you can't hit the nose or do you feel that you, it just gets scratchy? Like, what is it that actually happens? Um, a little of both. I, I'll definitely get very husky sounding and, uh, and I, I'll lose my upper register. Um, like at least the, at least the clarity. And I, uh, I sometimes can hit the notes, but it's, I have to push a lot harder and then that's when I'll kind of hurt myself kind of trying to overdo it. And, um, overexerting, which is really something a vocalist should not do <laughs> ever. Uh, so I also learned that the hard way multiple times before I started to see the warning signs and kind of could ease up and, and stop singing so hard. Um, but that took years for me to learn that lesson because I just, it's so much more fun to go all out and, you know, kind of leave it all on the table and and no matter what, but sometimes you kind of have to pick your battles. And if you know you have four more shows in a row, you really shouldn't like, leave everything in Kansas City. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's a good motto, I think, for for life in general. Yeah. Don't don't leave true. don't leave everything in Kansas City. <laughs> yeah. Maybe don't leave anything there. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> I think that my uh, when I sign off on my emails now, I'm going to have it say that. That's perfect. Okay. Well, I'm I'm very happy to be included in that. <laughs> I want that to be the name of your memoir when you put it out. Don't leave yeah. everything in Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> I want to write it down now so that, you know, in a few years. <laughs> what is your uh, relationship with your, with your voice now as opposed to when you began? Um, do you find that you are – obviously you're protective of it in a, in a way that you start thinking like, I want to sing, you know – professionally till I'm, you know, whatever age, but do you think about that? Do you, are you more protective of it than you were aside from just saying uh, no to certain things um, when you practice, when you're doing stuff live, what's your relationship now to, to your voice? Yeah, I think it's um, with age and experience, I've learned how to kind of, how to get the results I want without, hurting myself and I didn't you know I haven't really taken any vo vocal lessons that I mean I t I've taken maybe four in my life so I've learned a little bit from those but mostly I've learned from doing it over and over again and and trial and error and finding out what really doesn't work I've learned that for me personally sleep is one of the main factors with how well I can perform and um and Stress can be uh, one of the worst things, but yeah, I think you know I'm learning. I'm learning more and more about what I can and, and what I can do if I have those things. If I'm not stressed out, if I have sleep, then all of a sudden I keep surprising myself with the things that I can 
to kind of breaking barriers that I previously thought I had. So it's been it's, it's been an exciting sort of time in my life where I took all this time off of the road because I was pregnant and then I had a baby. And in that time, I had so much sleep. And you know, besides, well, when the baby came, not so much, but beforehand. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I was I could sing you know, circles around myself. And I was like, cool, this is a new thing I'm learning. If I take it easy and I take care of my body in a that way that I wasn't doing when I was 22, um, you know, I can really, I can accomplish something that I didn't think was possible for me. But I mean, not to say that, you know, it probably wouldn't be noticeable to anybody else, but for me, I can notice the differences. And, you know, when I'm singing the same song I've been singing for 10 years and all of a sudden I can hit a higher note than I used to be able to, you know what I mean? It's like, it's very subtle. <laughs> it's not like I'm all of a sudden Mariah Carey, but, um, <laughs> but I, it's been a fun uh, sort of proud moment to say like, okay, cool. Like it sounds so obvious, right? Take care of yourself and your body will perform better. But when you're a musician, you're not always encouraged to do that. You know, like you work in bars and you work, uh, you know, very closely with um, alcohol sometimes. Right. And I learned, you know, I learned I, that that's another thing that I, uh, a rule I made kind of early on that I can't, I don't drink before I sing anymore, which because the first couple of years of this band, I, uh, we all used to drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that was fun. But I was, again, I was like, early 20s 21 22 and that's what you do when you're that age so I'm not too hard on myself about it but well you were saying that you you've learned to say no uh which is by the way perfectly timed uh for motherhood right it's like it's good to it's <laughs> good to say no but um it, don't you find that liberating because it took me a long time to get there and now that I am comfortable saying no to people I'm so much happier Absolutely. I think that was a, the biggest lesson I learned from from having a kid was all of a sudden I just didn't have time to be a yes man anymore. Cause like, well, I got this other tiny human that I am really have to prioritize. So I can't just say yes to everything that you ask me to do anymore. <laughs> like, I got a lot of other shit to do, <laughs> including like feed this child. So yeah, that's an amazing lesson to learn. And anybody can do it. You do not have to have a child. Sorry, I have to feed my dog really quick. That's the clanking. No, no problem. Uh, uh, but yeah, that, that was a, it's been a really incredible ride in terms of becoming a parent and realizing, you know, we, I don't know. It's just, it's so life changing. And, and all the things that you could have been doing, like taking care of yourself and, you know, standing up for yourself and having a little bit more courage surrounding kind of basic things in life um they're all we can all do that all the time even without becoming a parent but uh having a little one kind of forces you to see things differently and do that a little bit more at least for me my, that was my experience so i mean i guess the irony is is that saying yes got you right to a certain point in your career um right right with those opportunities and then totally right and then you and now you have to sort of say like but now that i'm there i can't keep saying yes yeah because at a certain point i mean after 10 years there's certain things that you can't you just don't have energy for anymore <laughs> like um mainly just the the tour like the way that we used to tour that's the main thing that has changed and it's not even changed that much. It's really like maybe one less show a week. So, you know, I mean, also the way that we travel is vastly different. And we used to all sleep in like two hotel rooms and that was like nine people. So you do the math there. It was really crazy. But um, <laughs> a little bit has changed on that. We take a little bit better care of each other and ourselves on the road. But uh, yeah, but you're absolutely right. You have to you have to make those sacrifices when you're young and able to do it and you have the energy and and when the time calls for it, when you really need to step up and say, I will literally do anything to make this, you know, get off the ground. Um, and that's, you know, it's pretty, it's crazy that we, how long we've been doing it and then we're going to continue to work our asses off and try to, you know, I mean, I still feel like every extra moment that I have in life, aside from being a mother, I try to devote to this and, and you know, give it my all continuously because i think that's the only way we'll continue to be able to do it but you got to step back a little right <laughs> oh, yeah how how has being a mother changed the creative process for you 
Well, I think in all those ways that I said before, just it kind of gives you a new lease on reality and yourself and what, you know, a little bit more courage and a little bit more self-confidence. Um, so I think that really translated into this last record that I made. I, I definitely felt like all of a sudden I could call the shot a little bit um, more or completely, uh, which <laughs> I totally could have been doing that before, but I didn't really believe in myself enough to do it. And um, And I think... For some reason, watching myself have a have a child, like give birth to a child, I was like, "Oh man, I can totally do anything." What are you? Are you crazy? That was insane. <laughs> so, um, so that was, you know. But also the creative process while I was pregnant, I think, um, was beautiful. I wrote some of the songs, sort of, uh, well, definitely inspired by being pregnant, and um, and just having that clear head. Because of, I mean, not only being completely sober, which is great, and being well rested and not very stress free, I wasn't you know, after the fourth month. I wasn't uh, really working, so I had all this extra time to think about how to be creative and what kind of songs I wanted to write and stuff. So it was a really, it was like freedom um, to do that, which is a beautiful thing, and I think it's a necessary thing for me. I didn't, I never really write that well when we're, when we're playing all the time because I don't feel like I have the space in my brain for it, you know? I know, I know that some people, um, they're, they're kind of road warriors and they, and they do their best work on the road, but that seems like a real compressed kind of, uh, way of doing things. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think it works for some people in that some people will, I mean, historically speaking, like the band, even like Levon Helm and the band, they used to rehearse after their gigs and write songs together after they played like a four hour set. Um, And, you know, it's crazy to me. Like I, I I can barely walk sometimes. I'm so tired. (laughs) Um, But, you know, also cooking is a hell of a drug. So that was probably part of it for them. (laughs) Yeah. I was going to say, you know, it was a different era for sure. But um, that's something some people you know, can be sort of fired up by that. And I mean, performing does and get energy, but for me, it's not sustainable energy. It's about 15 minutes of like, okay, let's go talk to people. And like, woohoo, maybe have a beer. Oh my God. And then, oh my God, I'm so so tired. Get me to my bed right now. (laughs) It's very short lived. (laughs) Well, when you chose, when you chose this life, you, you chose the artistic life, which I'm sure was totally different than most people that you knew that were your age. Did you know what it was you were getting into? Did you did you think that through? Um, a little bit. My my dad and my mom, they, they um, my dad still plays drums in the band that he's in, but my mom used to sing, um, and that's how they met each other, was playing around San Francisco. So my dad did a very small amount of touring when he was in his 20s. And so he had these great stories of the old glory days. And so we had a little picture of it. You know, he didn't paint it very glamorously. He definitely said like, yeah, you know, sometimes it was this and that and terrible. And, but they didn't do it. Um, they didn't do it full time, really. But they went on a few tours, you know, so they had a little taste of it. So we had a little taste of it. We, and Jackson, my brother and I, when we started this, we just really wanted to freaking like travel and play music every day. That's all we wanted to do. And I think that that, that desire to do that kind of got us through those first couple of years, because that's all you're doing. You're traveling your ass off right. and you're playing music, you know, and you're, you know, eating crappy food. And um, if that's all you want to do right at that moment, then that's perfect. You know, um, we didn't right away. We didn't have big delusions of grandeur and think we were going to be, playing to great big audiences or, or anything like that in the first couple of years, we just wanted to play and we wanted to see the country and um, so it really suited us. Uh, but then, you know, what? after like five years of doing that, I think I was like, Oh yeah, right. Well, what was it like when I had a life and, and a place to live <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and a car of my own? Like I forgot about all that stuff that used to be normal. Um, so it, you kind of, I don't know. I think we were in a bit of a had tunnel vision with it for a long time, but that's, I think how we were able to keep doing it. But you were willing to put the miles in and that's, that's a huge component of, of a band's evolution. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think those first few years of touring really 
set the foundation for the rest of it. If we hadn't been able or willing to do that, we would still be playing the same places in New York City or or not because they'd be so bored of us. <laughs> they wouldn't let us play there anymore. Um, you know, you, we had to have the willingness. Um, I'm so sorry. Can, can you hold on for like two minutes? I just have to go check on my son. He's of course, of crying. course. Yes. Okay. I'll be right back. Thank no problem. You so much. No problem. Okay, so this is the point in the interview where our lead changes her son's diaper. So I thought it was a good time to play a song from Gold. When we come back, the diaper will have been changed, and the conversation will continue. This is Can't Get You Off My Mind from Gold by Sister Sparrow. Enjoy it right here on Stereo Embers, the podcast. change a diaper in 37 seconds yeah yeah i did <laughs> i am i'm like it's like the, the quick and the dead no wait, that's not right what's the yeah some <laughs> gunslinger movie just imagine i got that reference right you did that's look that's a fast draw um were you were there ever moments for you with the band where you kind of like hit a low point where you were like i don't know if i want to keep doing this i mean we're you're on a you know, a hotel room in somewhere weird and you went ugh. yeah i mean there were Sometimes I, I think that my, I think my tunnel vision, as I said before, it was pretty severe for such a long time because I was very blinded by ambition, I think. And I think that was good in a lot of ways. Um, I'm like, I'm grateful for that. Because of seeing how crappy our situation was, because I was kind of like, this is just how it's supposed to be. This is how it's going to be. And that's, I didn't have any higher expectations and, I think that's what got me through it, um, especially being the only female. That was, there were moments that I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about women. Like, I miss them so much. <laughs> <laughs> this is really hard. Um, but, but yeah, I think so. The one breaking point that I 
had it was a couple of years ago, and I I was in a lot of pain all the time. I have a bad back, and a couple of herniated discs, and um, traveling obviously not sleeping in my own bed and being in a van all day that exacerbates the the pain for sure, and also performing. <laughs> uh, so I, I hit a wall, and I said. I took the guys aside and I said, you know, I really want to take some time off for the first time in eight years and I want to maybe work on a solo project and I want to write a bunch of music and I need to rest and try to get my back fixed. And, and they were all really supportive and it was, it was great. So we planned to do that. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, we put a couple of book, uh, things on the book. So we were trying to maintain a nice block of time for me. Um, but that block of time started getting smaller and smaller. And then all of a sudden I found out I was pregnant. And so I uh, went back to the guys and I, was, I, you know, basically just said, well, remember how I said I want to take a year off? Like, we're going to go back to that now because we kind of have to. Now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so they were, they were very, very supportive. Uh, we did have to cancel some shows, but um but it was kind of perfect timing because I was reaching my breaking point anyway, if things were going to continue the way that they had been um, going. So I was like, it was kind of a strange, it was a happy, happy accident. for sure. Yeah. Uh, but it worked out timing wise. And, and then, you know, I mean, it was a little, it was a rough year for, you know, all of us to be out of work for that. But, but um, the, me being able to work on this, record was um I feel like it was a very important thing that probably wouldn't have happened if I hadn't had that block of time and that you know availability and also being stationary uh, for the six months that it took me to make the record was like you know invaluable so well I like that you didn't come to them and say I want to take time off and pursue my passion for accounting I mean it seems like you (laughs) right it was always the the artistic life has always been the choice Yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, we did have our, our trombone player who, well, he's formerly our trombone player, but he's still in my heart, will always be. Um, his name is Ryan Snow, and he actually quit the band a few years ago to go back to school to become a lawyer and sort of, but also to like make social change. And he's a beautiful human being, and he's one of the smartest people I know, but he, we were like, really, you're going to quit the band and become a lawyer? <laughs> Very surprising, <laughs> but he's going to change the world. He's he's awesome, so we're very proud of him. Well, you do, you know, in the old days, you would hear about punk bands that would travel on the roads, and then suddenly, you know, they they would call it a day, and then their bass player would be a professor at USC, and you're like, how'd that happen? Right. But they would they would just like, you know they would study on the road, or they would they always had a sort of a you know another plan. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I've never had a, a backup plan. <laughs> I think that that's another thing about the being being blinded by ambition thing. It's like, no, no, it's going to be fine. You just work hard enough and you can make it happen. Don't worry about your backup plan. You know, that's ridiculous. Why would you need that? And that's crazy, right? That's an insane way to think. Um, but I also think it's kind of a beautiful way to give your whole self to, to a thing. It's also... Um, it's scary (laughs) realizing that I've been doing it for this long. It's also kind of scary looking back on that, but, but now I have this, you know, I have a a tiny baby and that makes it me feel like there's a whole other side of my life that is, um, very full and beautiful as well. That I, that, you know, now I'll never be like lost in the wilderness, you know, (laughs) something, something didn't happen with music. I, I have. You have a very full life now, and that's, I'm very grateful for that. But. It is scary, though, not to have a backup plan. But sometimes when you're when you're so young, you don't even realize how how scary that really is. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Uh, I I don't think my brother and I even thought about it for like two seconds. You know, we were just and and I think people have started to ask, like when we were taking that time off, and somebody had asked him like, "Well, what do you?" what are you going to do now? Like what, you know, you're going to quit music and like get a real job, you know? And he was, well, like it's like slightly offended, but yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, no, I'm you know, going to continue on with my music. 
it is very much a real job <laughs> that people don't realize. Right. That. Yeah, know? it's a very, very difficult one. Yeah, incredibly. Um, it, for you, if your son said to you, hey, I want to be in a band, uh, and that conversation could happen. Um, not tomorrow, obviously. He, he's <laughs> – that's not going to happen. But, I mean, if that were – I mean, have you thought about how you would respond to that or – I mean, would you would you be thrilled, or would you would you say, you know, there's a career in accounting? <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe a little bit of both. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I would just, I would, I I want him to be musical, and I'm sure that he will be, um, even if he doesn't pursue that as a full on career. I think it's it would be great for him to be in a band, um, whether he wanted to do that forever or not. But <clears throat> I think that that's what most normal people do is just, you know, if they have been playing a band for a while and then they, you know, get serious and go back to school or whatever. Um, but I think that's a cool experience. I mean, my dad has been um, playing since he was a, in high school and he, but he is also a history teacher and he has, he used to teach college and he coaches golf and you know, like he has all this other stuff, but he still plays music like almost every weekend. Um, so I think that's a, a nice way to do it also. But yeah, I will never um, pull any punches with him. I'll definitely give him the straight story about what it's like and how hard it is and, and how rare it is to actually get as successful as you want to be. <laughs> um, so I think that's important to be honest as well with it. You know, it's it's funny because I'm a writer and I I would look at my heroes and many of them died horribly. And um, oh, and yeah. tragically and young. And I wonder for you, you know, looking at in, in music, like I think of Amy Winehouse, who I just adored, but that's such a tragic story. And I, I wonder, do you look at the people who inspired you and did you ever look at how their lives turned out? And I'm kind of curious, you know, like, you know, did you try to sort of did you see anyone that you that you thought set an example in a way of, oh, that's how to do it right for longevity? Mm. Yeah, Um well, I think the problem with with being creative is oftentimes that you do have those sort of addictive personalities, or like the um, <clears throat> like the, something about trauma and creativity that <laughs> somehow go hand in hand, unfortunately. And and um, you know, I I definitely keep my drinking in check. I think that's one thing that I could I could see myself if I you know if I didn't have such a good support system or <clears throat> I don't know, if like worse things that happened to me in my childhood, I could see, I can really see how, how easy it is to just go down that path um, and kind of lose yourself and lose, and then lose what you set out to do completely. Um, and, you know, we, we, we've gotten lucky that we have all supported each other and been honest with each other. Um, when times were getting, you know, a little close to the edge or <laughs> whatever it was, I think, I I don't know, I feel like personally having the, the people around you that kind of keep you in check has been the most important thing. But yeah, so the person that I would say um, that I know of uh, her story a little bit is that Bonnie Raitt, like I know she's been sober for many, many decades. And um and I, I look up to that and I'm not sober. I'd still, you know, I still like to have my glass of wine here and there, but, um, but I think that if you know yourself and you know that you are heading down a dark path and you can catch it wherever you are on that path, if you catch it and set it right and, and get back to the music and what makes you who you are and because alcohol does not make you who you are. It makes you an asshole. <laughs> so, um, I don't, you know, not everybody, I guess, but, uh, but I think that that's, that's an important thing. I, I always thought that was really cool. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people that stuck it out and are still alive have gone through recovery in, in one, um, in one way or another, you know, I think Edda James was, you know, went to Betty Ford at least once that she's one of the greats, you know, um, I don't really know about Aretha's struggles with addiction, although I probably should, but like, she's, I mean, she's such an incredible force that I feel like nothing was going to stop her. <laughs> Right. But those are like those are the women that I've looked to, and yeah, I think that it's important to kind of keep yourself, uh, be self aware enough to know, you know, when you need to step back or whatever. But creative people are vulnerable people, and I think that you know you're creative and you do your art, and then you have to perform it, 
And so I can totally understand why, you know, a drink or two before you get on stage or after uh, might be exactly what you would need or whatever your drug of choice would be. I totally understand that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's somehow um, it's, it's a really good pairing. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's just it, it really, unfortunately, it's it's a hard thing for a lot of us. And I think um, <clears throat> I, I don't know. I wonder. I wonder why that is. And I think, I think there's really something about, um, the, what you said, vulnerability and creativity. And there's a little bit of, you know, maybe a little bit of sadness or trauma in, in people's lives that make them, you know, a little bit closer to being able to unlock that and make some turn it into something beautiful for other people. Um, I don't know. I don't, I wish I knew the secrets of that because it's, you know, it's such a, it's such a problem for so many people and I think all we can do is is keep ourselves in check and also each other like those around you and art is a very raw thing <laughs> I think I think that it's hard for us to feel what we feel when we're doing it and and it's hard for us to feel how we felt doing it later on you know like after the show it's like oh I just want to forget that I was I was ever that you know exposed and you know completely out there for people to reach out and 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 hurt if they wanted you know it's kind of it's a scary line that we tow um in that you don't know if sometimes I feel like you go out there and you have, you have to like put your breadcrumbs to make sure you can get back so that you're not too, like just feeling crazy all the time you know I know performers who they'll do a show and then they need to be alone for a little bit just to sort of decompress are you like that do you need your time afterwards um, I mean, if it were up to me, I probably would take 10 minutes, <laughs> but it, it's not always, sometimes you gotta just, uh, just, you know, get back on that horse and, and go out there and, and, uh, and talk to people. And I do, I do love doing that as well. And that can sometimes be really therapeutic as uh, you go out and you, maybe you'll meet somebody who, this happens to me all the time. I feel like I go out and talk to people in the crowd afterwards and, and then inevitably I meet somebody who's going to say something that just like makes me feel like it takes a little bit of that, like um, takes a little bit of chip out off of that icy rock or whatever. <laughs> it's not icy rock, but it feels like it, it fills the void a little bit. And like alcohol fills the void very easily. But if you're not drinking after the show, which I've experienced a lot of that as well, sometimes you need a little something to just like a little pick me up. And so sometimes just talking to people that were, that were there can just really kind of set you set your mind a little bit at ease or it's you know it's always nice to get a little feedback it's not always positive <laughs> so, <laughs> sometimes people really want to be very honest um sometimes at the merch table and you're like what that one kind of stung a little bit now <laughs> <laughs> um it's funny how people think that they uh when you're when you are vulnerable with somebody and they think that oh okay so I have access to this person I can tell that I can say whatever I want to because they've already let me in so I'm gonna go up there and I'm gonna tell her that I think her haircut is horrible <laughs> <laughs> um, you know it's like I don't know why you thought you had the you know the right to do that but I guess I created that space for you I guess somehow in what I did while I was performing you know led you to believe that we were like but you know buddy. <laughs> Like, I guess we are. I don't know. It's just weird. So someone will st take the time to stick around after the show just to tell you they weren't feeling it or they don't love the haircut or they <laughs> don't like Yeah, sometimes. I mean, you know, it's not that often. Most of the time people are just very sweet and, and lovely. But you get the occasional uh, terrible person also. I'm, I mean, you know, there are bad apples in any crowd. I'm going to just say that. It's a percentage game, you know. So, um yeah, sometimes you, sometimes you have somebody who gets a little handsy, and like that's really not uh -huh. cool, and you know that's that's kind of derails your whole night. But um, it's just it's nice to know you have uh, people in your corner to kind of um, <laughs> protect you from that. But it it, it does happen um, more often than I'd like to say, unfortunately. But yeah, but that's another reason why, like taking a few minutes to yourself and just kind of meditating on what happened like makes you a little stronger and more prepared to go back out there and and deal with whomever may want to come tell you whatever they're gonna decide to do that night you know yeah 
Yeah, it's like, it's like you walk up to something, they go, they go, I want to give you some feedback. And you're like, oh, God. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> here we go. Here, here, here it comes. Um, what is it like for you with these songs that are you know written under the influence of pregnancy and motherhood? They're very intimate. And to be performing them you know, for the general public, does that feel like your most personal turn yet? Um, yeah, well, let me think about this. I think, uh, I think that younger, I may have been writing even more, more personal songs. Like, but the, the songs I wrote that were sort of inspired by my, by being pregnant, having a baby were, it was really just like seedlings of ideas. And I would kind of take it in, in different directions. So I don't know if you heard the new album but there's a song called you're my party oh yeah and it was really just like when i when i was pregnant i was like well i'm not i can't i'm not going out to party anymore so like i guess you're my party little baby <laughs> and then i started thinking about the course of that and um it obviously came in it's more of a sort of flirty song than it is a song about my child for sure so i wouldn't say it's like a direct correlation to my um, motherhood stuff but but when i was younger i think i wrote more um a little bit more like raw love stuff that was very honest about what was actually happening in my life and I think now I have a little bit of a buffer because it's maybe after doing it for so long it becomes a little hard to go up there and sing those songs that are really about what you're going through right now maybe that's because maybe I'm being a wimp and and maybe I should like you know grow up hair and get out there and like be a real artist and and say all the truthful (laughs) things all the time but I think I'm protecting myself a little bit. Yeah, you got to keep some of it for yourself. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. So you, you like, there's a real narrative. You sense the narrative shift in your work. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know if I did what was happening, but um, it's funny. I, you know, sometimes in an interview, you can realize things that you uh, had not previously. So I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about my old my other records and sort of how tumultuous life was back then. And, and yeah, I think that um, this this new album, it was a little bit coming from more of a secure place, a little bit more of a, um, a stable place. Um, and I, I also wrote with a lot of other writers. So it's it's definitely, it's got a, a lot more than just my raw narrative. Um, and I, I like it in that way because it's it's a little bit, it's a little different. It's a little, you know, it's fun and it, it's not just me, um, <laughs> in my, you know, basement, like crying and writing a song. Like, that's fine too, but it's also, it's a lot more fun for me to kind of get into a part of, I work with other people and, you know, things that I would never have thought of, um, melodies and stuff like that, that just were not in my wheelhouse. And it's really fun to play around with that stuff. Do you like that collaborative process? Yeah, it's it's sort of new for me. I mean, I've I've done you know a couple dozen writing sessions before, but um, but still, it's, it's sometimes it, it's it's hit or miss. It can it can go one of two ways, uh, or it can go the third way where like you get like a fine song, but you don't end up using it. But then the the ones that are super inspiring and so fun, that's a really really great thing to be a part of, and it's. Um, it's it's a new thing, you know. I used to write all the music by myself all the time, and um, and I I I think it was a because I was insecure and didn't think that I would be able to, you know, stand up to another writer in a room. Um, and b I think it was because I just didn't have the connections and didn't know anybody that really I would feel like comfortable writing with. But it's a really scary thing to do. I mean, I don't know if you've ever done any collaborative writing in your time but it's like it's it's so scary (laughs) um to be that honest and and try to give your all because you kind of feel like your ideas are probably like i always feel like my ideas are shit at the time of saying them out loud but then sometimes it's like oh shit that was my idea i like that now you know right well i mean i think the scary thing about writing with somebody else the two scariest things are one giving a note and two getting a note right yes Totally. <laughs> and that's, and when it's, you know, when you're writing a song, it's all happening like in real time, you know, like you, um, there are lots of times where, you know, somebody would say something and it like, even if one of the three or four people in the room didn't like it, like it wouldn't really 
go because it's like this is a we're all in this together like we kind of all have to agree and that's a it's like actually kind of a hard task to get four people to agree on a creative thing um but it happened we did it so <laughs> can you can you take a note are you pretty good at taking criticism i'd like to think so i think in that in that scenario yes because i am still very insecure um especially about that about writing and I still feel like I'm the most in, in experienced person in the room, even if I'm not, um, because I just assume that everybody's that's in there is like, you know, brilliant and well, super accomplished. Even if I, I'm not really the kind of person who like Googles everybody thoroughly before I meet them or anything. So I just I like to just get into it and and then see how the session goes, and then we can take it from there. But but yeah, I don't mind taking, I don't mind hearing criticism and and. I mean, we did a lot of that in the band where we were, I would bring the songs to the guys and then we would arrange them all together and we would, uh, we'd all have a pretty equal say back in those days about how the arrangements went. And so, you know, I definitely, my, my skin was thickened in that way because I was able to hear all seven other people's opinions about my work. Um, you know, even though I'm sure they tiptoed a little bit around me, but not all the time. <laughs> Well, I was in graduate school for poetry, and I can tell you so many times people would get criticism, and they would run from the room screaming and crying, going, you don't know what I'm oh. trying to do. Oh, God. Yeah. And it's they never, so hard. I know, and their skin never got thick. You don't, You just don't understand <laughs> me. <laughs> it's like, yeah, maybe maybe not. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I don't. You're You're very emotional. Yeah. Um, but I mean, when, with these people that you were writing with, I mean, were they people you chose or were they sort of, how did that, how did that happen? Um, it was, it was kind of like a little bit of happenstance and a little bit of, um, trusting the producer I was working with. Ah. So, um, yeah, so Carter, the first session that I had with him was just a writing session with another writer that I had worked with before. So that was sort of happenstance. And then I loved working with him so much. And then he had all these writers in mind that he thought would be perfect for the genre. And so he brought in a lot of his friends. So, um, yeah, it was, it was kind of like that. It was like New York connections. And, and I trusted Carter implicitly. Um, he was really great in that. Arlie, I love this record. I love this conversation. Make sure you get better. Don't leave everything in Kansas City. And <laughs> you either. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> but thank you so thank much you for so your much. time. It's so good to talk to you. Yeah, you too. I appreciate it so much. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. There you go. Sister Sparrow. Loved chatting with her. Gold is out now. Go to sistersparrow.com and get it. If you want to get Stereo Embers, the podcast, we're on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Check out past episodes, leave us a review, throw us some stars. You know how it works. It's Yelp Nation, kids, and we're all a part of it. Uh, if you want to see what's up with me, go to alexgreenonline.com. Maybe I'm coming to your town to read from my novel, The Heart Goes Boom, or maybe I'm going to interview an author at your local bookstore, or maybe we're doing a live taping of Stereo Embers, the podcast. Any of these things could be happening. Uh, now, if you want to email me, please do it, editor at stereoembersmagazine.com. Maybe there's a guest you'd like me to track down for the program. Well, suggestions are best sent to that address. On Twitter, at Embers Editor, and on Instagram, Embers Podcast. Are you writing all this down? I know, it's a lot of information. Uh, here's some more information. Sister Sparrow's new single is called Ghost, and it is out now. There's a great clip for it on YouTube, but here's the audio version for you right here. All right? I'll see you next week. Enjoy the song. And thank you, as always, for supporting Bombshell Radio and Stereo Embers, the podcast. Left me for dead, I guess. Kept your secrets under your bed. You never really loved me like you said. Now you want it. You want it. Stop calling me at 2 a.m. I never call you.
Inferno. 